So I, I remember reading about you. So I used to have a subscription to Metal Hammer back in the day. And they would have their their kind of um, more artsy stuff in the back, you know, around paired with black metal and stuff. And that's when I first saw a, uh, a review of Oxbow and saw a photo of you in your underwear, you know, mm. looking like Henry Rollins, you know, just with your eyes rolled back in your head and it said like, oh, you used to choke people out at concerts. I was like, yeah. Fucking hell. And there was a book yeah. review hey, as well. And all those people, all those people had it coming. A hundred percent. Fuck them. Yeah. Audiences, yeah. um Yeah, man. O- audiences require punishment. Well, uh, well listen, I would I wouldn't throw a lit cigarette at a guy like me, but somehow somebody thought it'll be funny if I throw a lit cigarette at him. <laughs> and it was funny. <laughs> just, just, just a different just a different kind of funny. So uh, yeah, because it's funny. I, I've noticed that um, going to concerts, uh, I, I quit drinking about five years ago. So I go to concerts and I, I realize now that drunk people just annoy the hell out of me. And it, it yeah. occurs to me that 99% of the time, if, if anything's ever spoiling my enjoyment of a concert, it's someone yep. in the audience. It's not the band. Yep. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's the thing. I used to work for many years as, as a bouncer. So I have, I have my level of, of, I just, I can't tolerate it. I just, you know, I just can't stand it. I can't stand it. So, but I've gotten better. I've gotten better. I've gotten to be like kind of Nina Simone, where if it gets really bad, you know, I always have the option. It's built into our contract of just leaving. I just leave. I can still get paid. And yes, it's, it screws the other people out of a show, but it's not my problem. <laughs> yeah, no. Where's the club security? Where's it? You know, somebody has to speak up for the little guy on stage. Hundred percent. And it's like you know, disappoint some people, assault charge. Which one? <laughs> which one's easier to manage in the long run? Amazingly enough, I, I've never, I've never. The police have. Well, I've been yanked off the stage a couple of times by police. Once was when we played with King Diamond. And then the other was when we played with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, that was as Whipping Boy. Um, but other than that, I've had very few interactions with the police at our shows, regardless of what I've done. <laughs> Strange. Uh, I, I learned a hard lesson the other day. It was because I, I realized, like, damn, I, I know of Oxbow, but I don't know, you know, enough of the band. So I mainlined four of your albums back to back, your most recent one. And then I started from Fuckfest and worked my way forward. So Fuckfest, oh, nice. Thin, The Thin Black Duke, and I believe The Narcotic Story. And yep. I realized it's a bad idea to be listening to your music while trying to do high impact cardio because I'm used to yeah. metal music and instead I've just got your tortured wailing in my <laughs> Yeah, I would say in one sitting, that's kind of a way to to guarantee that you probably kill yourself. <laughs> Don't, you're not supposed to. We've lost a lot of lot of Oxbow listeners. It's just so many that I've started to think, it's not the music that makes them suicidal. They're suicidal already, and the music seems to go along with that. So I can't take any responsibility for that, thank goodness. Yeah, it's, it's definitely the soundtrack to, you know, crossing state lines with a bottle of whiskey and a handgun, you know? <laughs> Which I've done. <laughs> Amazingly enough, I tell you, when I go on book tours, that's how, you know, it's just you in a car with a bunch of books. And then because it's America, I don't think you should travel anywhere unarmed. So uh, armed. And then, of course, you know, you can't have a, a container in the car. So the whiskey would have been in the trunk. But it was just it was amusing to once get stopped by the cops in Oklahoma. And I see them in the rearview mirror. They drawn their guns as they walk up to the car and uh they say you know taps on the window with the gun (laughs) and i roll the window down and he said can i see your license and registration and i say one word and i say certainly and they hear me and you know i don't know your ear is a bit different because of where you're from but i think they were expecting like 50 cent (laughs) and they got they heard Obama in the voice. So they just like, they put their guns away and they were all relaxed and they were like, Oh, you know, you were doing a little bit over the speed. Let me just be careful. I was like, Oh, I will. Thank you. Thank you. And of course though, the car was full of guns. <laughs> I mean, I was like the prime person that should have been stopped. 
you know, drugs, guns, books, but whatever. They they thought it didn't make sense to bother. I mean, I wasn't selling narcotics, so why bother me? Right? I, I'm thinking of Bill. I, I get reminded of Bill Hicks, and I'm thinking like in certain parts of the of the United States, they'd be more concerned that you had books in your car than uh, than yeah. guns. It's like, well, looks like we got ourselves a reader. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. I I, I remember. Yeah, we on to- on touring in the old days with Whipping Boy. We stayed with a guy who was a he was a a, a fourth grade teacher, and our our guitar player at the time was also a teacher. And he's like, "You're a teacher in California, right?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "So are you teaching that? Uh, are you teaching that the evolution stuff?" <laughs> and my guitar player goes, "Yeah, he, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you know, come on, man, unbelievable. Okay, evolution." I, it's funny. Uh, you mentioned in the the opening of your book that people, um, you haven't really. I don't know if this is the right way to phrase it, but you haven't really cared a lot about your race, and you find you found it annoying when people tried to make assumptions about your life and about how you see the world. Mm-hmm. You know, as a black man, is is, is America just obsessed with race? Like, it, yeah, America is obsessed with race uh, to an unhealthy degree. And I think it's because America has never had any race reckoning, right? Like in a place like, you know, Germany, for example, where they've <laughs> aggressively denazified uh, post-World War II, you know, I don't know that Germans are any more enlightened than, you know, well, I guess I would have to say probably a little bit more than they were in 1943, but they addressed it, you know, but the Civil War ended in America. And that's not that long ago. Like I have relatives who... Um, like my great great grandmother was still alive when I was born, and her father had been a sharecropper, previously a slave. So this is not remote in in the American memory, 1865, and they just never dealt with it, man. And you know, and the southern states, and I'm not going to do the typical northerner thing because I'm from New York, but the southern states have a completely different relationship to the 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 non southern states still to this day. Um, and and weirdly enough, the race politic in the su- in the southern states in America is less strange than it is in the northern parts. You know, because at least they've had they were the, it was foisted on them, not a Marshall Plan, but this idea that you had to somehow change the way you are or think think about things. So no, this is temptation. This is temptation. And I tell a story in the book about the the orange suits and the and the hunting for raccoons. Because that I I would ha- I would have some inner secret you know avenue like I could be like your Tarzan and I could communicate the the, the secrets of the dark inner city to it's like that's not, that's that, you can't put that on any black person so I'm not bored with race but I'm t- bored talking with white folks about race <laughs> mm, yeah <laughs> you know, you know and, it's just, and having like, to answer all the different questions like as a black as a black man in America shut the fuck up <laughs> exactly. Oh. And, you know, there are ways to figure it out. You can go move to a black neighborhood. You can figure this stuff out pretty quick. You know, I mean, you know, with the exception of of a few years, I've mostly lived in minority neighborhoods. In the neighborhood I am in now is mostly Pacific Islanders, Tongans, Samoans, and Mexicans, and you know, smattering of black folks. But um, but you know, you can. I, I've always had friends in those neighborhoods who were like white dudes, white dudes who lived in the same neighborhoods as I did. And they were just much more relaxed about race, <laughs> you oh. know, but America ghettoizes itself. So you, you know, the neighborhood where I'm sitting in now, you know, you've got, we have Brazilians, we have Indians, we've got some Polish people next door. I, I mean, that's not where I'm living right now, where I used to live. Um, but, you know, it takes a special, th- I mean, yeah, California is strange too, because everybody's in their cars. So I, I just want to avoid the thing where people would be reading the book and nodding and, and they'd be like, yeah, well, you know, black people. <laughs> like, like somehow my experience was framed by the fact that, well, that's just something that black people do. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, I went to your schools. I went like, you know, see, like um, dude says from suicidal tendencies. I went to your schools, your educational learning facilities, you know. So uh, it's not it is not particular to the black experience or put another way. It is very particular to the black experience because the black experience is the American experience. So, hmm. um, so I read the, uh, pre-release, 
version of the book, which I, which is the first few chapters. Right. Um, I am thrilled that you survived your upbringing because holy crap. Um, yeah. the, the childhood adversity, the introduction to weightlifting, and I, it hasn't been mentioned in the book yet, but I'm sure the journey into hardcore punk, I'm seeing a, a few parallels between you and Henry Rollins. Mm-hmm. It was, I don't know. Am I talking out of my ass? Oh, well, he, he comes up in the book and figures in it heavily. So I oh, guess you're going get, to get, get to those chapters. I, um, um, no, we, we had a very different, different deal. I mean, our, our parents, um, both of my parents were bohemians. <laughs> it sounds like only his mother was, and his father was a racist prick. So I was not raised by any racist pricks. Um, and I, I certainly wasn't put into military school. I did have problems with hyperactivity. And I, I get the sense early on that uh, Rollins was always much more of an outsider than I ever was. And that, and that is kind of the weird distinguishing, you know, uh, that though I had outsider urges and, and felt that way inside, I was usually comfortably socially well socially placed right mm-hmm. i was a good good friends good friendships relationships wasn't the kid who was lurking around by the water cooler in high school was generally well liked by you know uh if i wasn't punchy in the face I, you, you know <laughs> I, you pretty much liked me right so but i think rollins i mean like in the latter days of black flag he got into this weird space where he was doing this uh like Rene Girard, the French philosopher, the, you know, the sacrificial crisis. He was having one every night. And I remember at one point seeing him, I think in Detroit, in a fetal position on the edge of the stage, not so much inviting people to strike him, but people were striking him and he wasn't stopping them. And so, you know, the audience was like Day of the Locust, that book by Nathaniel West, where they'll, of course, you know, you give them meat, they're going to eat the meat. And they're like hitting him and he's on stage. And I was like, not, never in a million fucking years never whatever emotional thing was happening to get him to that point I, 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 it never happened to me <laughs> yeah, never yeah. you know and i mean indeed i talk about that in the book where my bouts of you know suicidal ideation until somebody set me right and then i was like yeah there are many more people who deserve to die than me and maybe i should get about that <laughs> you know my suicidal ideation became homicidal ideation right <laughs> <laughs> i um like I said, I haven't got to that that uh, that part of the book yet because we only got the first uh, first few chapters. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I remember reading that was Fuckfest originally a, a suicide note. Yeah, it was. <laughs> wow. it, you know, and it, it goes to show you, like, you, like I mean, you know, your thinking is so adult at that point where you're like, yeah. You know, I'm gonna say they're they're gonna hear this and they're gonna fucking know. They're gonna know, man. They're gonna they're gonna get it. <laughs> of course, I know. I know that that it's even beyond getting it. You have to care to get something. <laughs> so, yeah. That that nobody would have cared to get it, right? So the people I was wanting to send the message to would have just been like, "What? Eugene's dead. Ah, that's too bad. Hey, what's for dinner?" <laughs> what? I'd the same thing with alcoholism. I'd be like, you know, it, 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 you know, I would be borderline overdosing on substances in my early 20s yep. and yep. you know potentially thinking oh i think i'm about to die ah yep. well it's like poetry nobody said you just get sober you idiot what do you what no one cares yeah yeah, yeah that's and ultimately i found that liberating or, or maybe no one cares but people cared in a very specific way because that was fuck fest was when we got invited to you know, when nobody was asking us to play anywhere at that point, we got invited to go to London to play. And so, you know, it was kind of, you know, a post-punk version of what happened with Sally Fields, you know. Oh, somebody cares that they actually want to see me alive long enough to finish this show. Okay, well, maybe I won't do it just yet. So, well, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's funny. Yeah, You're obviously, you, you write a lot about, the uh, your own childhood experiences and the kind of kind of trauma and this horrible stuff that would be happening on a day to day basis in households in the sixties. Um, yeah. To what extent you've had uh, 
three from the just going back through your social media, you have three daughters, and I believe you just had a a, a fourth child. Is that right? A fourth daughter. I've got four daughters. <laughs> this is somehow comic punishment. I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I never wanted sons because I've got such a terrible relationship with my father, and he had a terrible relationship with his father. That and in my family, men are only are born in, they can marry in, but are born in every 50 years. There's my uncle Sammy, who's, you know, I'm about, he's about 50 years older than me. He's dead now, of course. And I'm about 50 years older than my grandson. So, um, <laughs> actually 55 years older than my grandson. So, uh, everybody else, girls, 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 I have four sisters and that's, that's what I knew. And that's what I wanted. I was terrified of having a son. So. That's yeah. interesting. So where I, where I was kind of going with this is that if, if for people who have grown up in in adversity, has it been strange? Um, how did that inform your own parenthood? And like, do you hear maybe some of their complaints as being first world problems compared to what you came from? No, because I've shared it all with them by way of cautionary tales in the same way that my mother, you know, who was, taken up to a rooftop in the Bronx and threatened, you know, was being threatened with being thrown off by some lunatic in her neighborhood. Also told me about a boy in her neighborhood who got his penis cut off. So don't go anywhere with anybody. You know, I employed a lot of that stuff by way of teachable moments and cautionary tales, you know, um, and, uh, and, and they all got it, it, it you know, um, but I, you know, the most elemental and all my kids didn't had to do as a condition of their birth, martial arts from you know the age of three on and not the bullshit martial arts right like the ones where it's theoretical like okay you do this punch and then they're gonna fall and then you could jump on their head and no 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 it's, it was gonna be muay thai it's gonna be grappling you know wrestling and brazilian jiu-jitsu thing or judo throw hip throw, you know stuff that you really practice and do and i did this until they went i was a fascist about it until they got to high school and then I suggested, well, a good step for you now that you've done, you spent, you know, eight years, nine years doing this, maybe switch over to wrestle when you're in high school because it, it'll look great on your college application. And so they all became wrestlers, all went, became state champion wrestlers, and it did help them. You know, all my kids got to their first college choices and only one of them still, still, well, two of them still sort of train. So actually all three of them still sort of train. One does it much more regularly than, than the others. And she was my previous youngest one. So they've all, you know, fighters able to beat grown adult men, which is great because <laughs> they'll come out and visit. And then they'll say, yeah, I'm going to come by where you, cause I'm there seven days a week, train with you. And it's funny watching these guys go, Oh, I'll go, I'll, I'll fight with her. And then I look over and they're like struggling to like not lose. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean they're better than they're better than I am at this. So yeah, so I've 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 been fucking have being the father of daughters is great, man. So yeah, no no aikido or taekwondo, none of that, none of that piss. Uh, yeah, you know what? I, I'm sure guys who are, who've been doing that for 20 years are probably pretty good at it, but it's it's know. useless. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I took I took I took kempo karate for 10 years, so I think I can comfortably say it is useless. Yeah. <laughs> I try to tell people, you know, I was, um, you, you know, like yourself, I was a bouncer for several yep. years before I went into yep. my, my current occupation. And I try to tell people that, yeah, all that striking is good to go, but every almost every fight is on the ground within yep. 15 seconds. And yep. you need to know how to handle yourself or otherwise you're going to die. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then, then the, 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 typically to that argument, they'll say, well, if there are numbers of people, I go, and? The, the numbers of people, I'm, listen, Some we played a show in D.C., an acoustic show, if you could believe it, and I got into a fight with some guy in the audience, and I had just had surgery on my knee, so I had to hobble off the stage to fuck up this guy who was, you know, he crossed the line and talking during an acoustic show really loudly right by the stage where I can see you. It's fucking disrespectful, and it's, in, you know, you're an enemy of art, and you're a guy in a band, you should know better. So I tell the guy, hey, uh, how about shutting the fuck up? And the guy goes, uh, yeah, oh, okay, whatever, man. I go, not, not whatever. Shut the fuck up. 
And the guy was drawn back at me. I said, hey, I got a question for you. Do you think you could kick my ass? And the guy said, uh, no. I go, good. Then shut up. He goes, I go back to the mic. And right as I get the mic to my mouth, he goes, but I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> it's like, That's not the discussion. I'm trying to do a show. You're a guy in a band who should know better. And I, at that was the point at which it was it. I threw the cane down, hobbled off the stage. It was like, you know, it's important for me to have him strike me first because then I've got, I'm defending myself at that point. So I get super close to the guy and I'm like, so is this what you want? You want personal, close personal contact with me. And I put my nose as close to him as I can get without touching. And he has a burst of homosexual panic, pushes me. <laughs> and at that point I can go, oh, I've been attacked. <laughs> Boom. And I, I kind of light him up, uh, uh, hit him with a jab. And, you know, he stands back and I'm like, well, where are we going to go? Are you just going to shut up or can I get? And he jumps on me, <laughs> which is like to a grappler. Man, I, it was like, God loves me. He jumps on me. I get him in a he ultimate head and arm, sit through, put his right arm through my leg. So he's kind of crucifixed on the floor. And somebody videotaped it because the funniest thing in the world, because I wouldn't have heard it any other way. He's at that point, he says, All right, all right, all right. I'll let you up now. <laughs> you're gonna let you're gonna let me up. But he had friends there, and his friends were like all around us. And at the point where I have his arm pinioned so tight that it's almost about to break, what are they gonna do? And I said at the time, I said, if you hit me again, because one of them tried to hit me from the back, if you hit me again, I'm gonna break his arm. And then I'm going to fuck you up. So unless it was a melee attack that they had, they they were not going to risk having their guitar player friend get his arm broken, you know? So, so far, thankfully, so thank, thankfully, that's a thing of the past. Of course. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, how, what was it about the hardcore scene that first drew you in? Oh, uh, it, it was probably a tonal thing, right? I mean, it was, you, you know, I remember I mean, the music, like I listen to certain types of, you know, I used to be a disco dance instructor, right? And there's certain, even now to this day, when I hear certain types of disco, it just, it, it, you can feel, you don't, if you, if you understand nothing about disco, um, understand cocaine. <laughs> Right. I mean, there's certain like drugs and music that the mating has been so perfect that to really understand the depth and the degree of people's passion for disco, you really have to understand cocaine. And, you know, between 77, 76 and 80, that that was completely, you know, you can't separate them in my mind. Um, but, you know, as a teenager listening to that music, I couldn't really afford cocaine. Cocaine used to be expensive. And when I had cocaine, it was from the Colombian drug dealers that I was friends with who were not into going dancing. They just would like, we'd stand in closets and do cocaine and we'd hang out. They, but initially what I found, um, I liked the tribalism of disco. Um, I liked uh, 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 I, some of the music I actually liked, but it didn't have, it started to get not answer my emotional needs, which in high school were, you know, in New York in the 70s, you know, again, I tell people, you want to know what I was going through? Watch Taxi Driver. Like this is that was filmed around my high school. You know that where Jodie Foster tries to get into the cab was a, a porno theater that we used to play hooky and go to. Right? It's like really like a two blocks from the high school. And when the guys were walking down the street screaming, "I'm gonna kill that!" That guy was a local from the neighborhood. Like we used to, we'd avoid him going to school. Like he was a real guy. So, um, but hardcore when it hit, they were making the same papers you know, the gossip papers that all the stupid shit that was happening in Studio 54 was making, but it had an edge, you know, like you saw the Ramones and they, you know, these guys are carrying knives and they would, it seemed to be like a dangerous place to be. And I've always gravitated toward, like, you know, <laughs> the first time after the wall fell in Germany, I was on some business trip there and I stayed in the, the, the company, I, it was Apple I was working at put me up in a nice hotel and some guy came and said, yeah, it's a good hotel, but I need to tell you, you shouldn't walk east. You know, it's kind of back where the wall was, East Germany. It's really rough. You don't want any trouble. And I was like, all right, okay. 
he leaves. I leave the hotel. I walk east. <laughs> it just, and so that that's pretty much kind of a corollary for what happened. I was reading about, you know, Sid this is stabbing Nancy Spongin and James Chance attacking the audience. And it was just, you know, it was um, a wildness that, that, that was resonating with stuff inside of me. And I, that's how I found it, you know. If, yeah. And now I listen, I, I listen to that music now and the, the music that I was first listening to that, and it's so fucking tame. It's like Eddie and the Hot Rods. It's just like rock and roll, you know. Early Ramones is like rock and roll. But then it was like dangerous. It's it's crazy to think though, isn't it? Like, you know, I'm a full-blown metalhead and it's hilarious to me. Like the first time I heard, uh, I finally heard Judas Priest and the way I'd heard people talking about this for decades, like, oh, I was yeah. expecting something really intense and I hear it's just really kind of tame kind of rock and roll. I'm like, this was dangerous? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, with, with them, you know, coming out on stage in a motorcycle, you know, some of that shit really was. Like when I saw the plasmatics for the first time, and Wendy O. Williams came out with a shotgun. They didn't get any permits for that, man. They were like, and, and that hasn't really caught on. The only other people who use shotguns on stage that I know have been the butthole surfers. I wouldn't even trust myself with a shotgun on stage, much less, you know, want to be at a show where that's happening. But yeah, this stuff, what strikes you, I mean, I remember it was Jewish priest, the name, and there was this kind of mystique. And then, you know, the motorcycle on stage and all the leather and, uh, I, you know, then you kind of hear it, and it's like, no, yeah, okay. <laughs> I did find it kind of hilarious, though, that uh, he was such a uh, Rob Halford was such a trendsetter, and all these tough macho men saw him wearing leather, and so they yep. started wearing leather and had no idea that he was ripping from the Leather Queen scene because he was gay. Well, Which, yeah, that's but that's that's on people who like what well, I would say who lived in the provinces because. You know, the West Side in the in New York, in again in the seventies before AIDS hit, that was a a, a crazy that was a happening scene, but it was also a crazy scene. And again, it it was you'd go over by the ramrod or the anvil <laughs> and you'd be like scared. You know, you'd be driving through. <laughs> you know, I remember an actual an actual uh, I was walking through and I, I was across the street, so my vantage point, I could see like either end of the, these triangles, and I see a pickup truck driving toward me, you know, and there were tons of gay dudes out on the sidewalk, and these guys had baseball bats in the bed of the pickup truck, and it was clear that they were going we're gonna to go get some faggots, and they're like, hey, and, and they're coming to the corner and about to turn on the spot, and they're like, hey, you fuck, and then as it turned around the corner, it was all like, fucking muscled leather daddies and they're like hey and they shit their fucking <laughs> so they just kept driving i was like ah you cowards yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, i mean you lose that fight man you're losing more than the fight if you know what i mean those guys were those guys were fucking scary bro you know yeah, man the last club I, I bounced at before i left security was a guy was one of the oldest gay bars in melbourne yeah and you know i'm hanging out with some guys who were you know, like hardcore. These guys yep. are in their fifties. You know, they've dealt with. They had to deal with AIDS. You know, the, the yep. AIDS crisis, yep. and you know, these guys had to defend themselves from what was called poofter bashing. You know, yep. in the you know in the eighties in yep. Australia, that yep. was a fucking national sport, and it's like these yep. are hardcore people. Uh, um, hey man, hey man, there was a guy. It happened here. A buddy of mine used to work at the front desk at the gym, and we're bullshitting at the front desk, and some guy comes up. And, He's like, well, you got a problem here. And it's a problem. And so he's in the locker room, you know, and he's kind of a tough street kid, you know, and he's changing. And there's another guy in the locker room who was looking at him. And uh, he says, yo, what's up? <laughs> and the guy was looking at him, you know, <laughs> walks over to him and says, what's up? And he goes, yeah, bro, you're looking at me. He goes, yeah, I'm looking at you. You're lucky I don't bend you over and fuck you right now <laughs> and he was like you gotta you gotta understand race politics so this street kid he's like he's like a mexican street kid he's kind of tough and he's talking to this what he just thinks is like a normal white guy but this fucking white dude was like muscle and if he had the eyes to see he would have seen that that guy is what we call a regular customer that guy was fucking prison bound man he <laughs> he had he had penitentiary 
I saw him after he came out of the locker room. And and my friend who was working at the front desk was really unsympathetic as he should have been. He was like, oh, you want me to talk to him? Because, oh, no, no, don't talk to him. There he is now. I got to go. And then the guy leaves. And so we see the guy. It's like, yeah, man, I wouldn't fuck with that guy. Look at him. He looks like he got out of San Quentin yesterday. <laughs> what are you going to try to get tough with him? Because, well, you're Mexican. Fuck, no. These guys went through a lot and, you know, give them wide berth. Yeah. We, there's a leather bar. There's a, there's a leather bar that we play uh, up in San Francisco here. Uh, Doug Hilsinger, who used to be in that band Bomb, he started working there, and he said, "I'm gonna book a rock night." And so we start playing this leather bar, and it, it was great. Our drummer's wife at one point was sitting at the bar, you know, and all these leather daddies are at the bar, and so I'm on stage, and you know, at first it gets hot, so I take my shirt off. One guy looks up and goes, "I think I've had about enough of this guy." <laughs> and my drummer's wife was like it is a gay bar right and then it was like super hot so I said fuck it so I take my pants off and the guy looks up he goes that's it and he walks out <laughs> I was like what does it say about us that I'm clear at gay bars <laughs> I guess my appeal is very it's very niche <laughs> <laughs> look speaking of clearing a bar you once saw yeah. G.G. Allen live now this yeah. guy gets mythologized a bit uh I don't know. What was that experience like? Uh, it was at Ruthie's Inn, this club up in o Oakland, um, which is you know, mostly like a black neighborhood. Wes Robinson was a black guy. The promoter booked it, and he knew what he was getting into. So he, he, he And he was, Gigi was fucking late, and it was the most masterful thing I've ever seen. He was late. He finally shows up, and everybody was queued up, like queued up. He steps up to the microphone. I think Merle, his guitar player, was named Merle, I think. Merle, like, hits one note. Gling! Riot! <laughs> I said, like, what? What note, man? They didn't play a fucking song. It was one note. People start just smashing everything. And not only that, they ran out of the club and they were running down uh, Ashby, I think the street it was, and were breaking store windows. And if I were Gigi, I'd have just been like, my work here is done. <laughs> Give me my fucking money. I, I, you know, I did what I came to do. It was, it was massively crazy. It was pretty perfect. Thing at all. But, um, so what are your, uh, what are your plans for the rest of the year, mate? So you, you've got this, this book coming out. You've also got a new Oxbow, uh, record, which has come out. What are the, what's the rest of the year looking like for you? Um, it, 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 it will be relentless. So we do 16 dates, September 1st to September 16th in, uh, in Europe. Um, come back, do, uh, like New York, Boston, Philly, San Francisco, LA, Arizona, uh, Seattle. And then coincidental to this, I'll be doing book shows as well. So if I have a show in, in America in the daytime, or at nighttime, we'll do a book show in the day. Um, and when we finish kind of playing shows, I think sort of in December, I'm continuing the book tour. And um, and we actually, because of Epicac and their long reach, we actually have um, people working with promoters in Australia, um, which it turns out if we go there, then we have to do Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Which we played Japan. We played Japan before, and then in May, I have another the fourth record coming out with uh, Bunuel. So then we'll go on tour with that in June, and then uh, Oxbow is working on another record now, a companion to Love's Holiday, which will come out probably that September, and so we'll play shows on that. So it'll be pretty relentless. And then I'm I'm planning on leaving America by the end of next year because I fucking had it with this country. So. Where where would you end up going, Eric? Uh Spain. I'm having a house built in Spain. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, you know, I take my my house here from the the, the low income <laughs> ghetto that I live in here, and said, hmm. what could I afford and where? And you you know, because they have all these like calculators, so you can look at Realtor.com, just go from country to country to see what you could afford based on what you have now. And it was like. You mean I can go from where they're running gun battles in front of my house, which there are. <laughs> I can go from there to an 11,000 square foot fucking plot in Spain. 
guy, it's simple. That's that's a no brainer, man. So, and I don't know anybody in bands where all the band now lives in the same place anymore. So I, I'm I'm excited about it. Yeah, obviously, I I am saying this as a guy who's just seeing it on the news, but obviously we get a lot of American politics over here, and it just seems like an absolute shit show. Yeah, know. I have some friends. People talked about leaving when George W. Bush was president. They were foolish. They didn't leave. I knew only one person who actually left, but now people have gotten more serious, and friends of mine in uh, doing music, I call him in L.A. He's like, I'm not in L.A. now. Where are you? Berlin. Moved. I, I go, what? He goes, yeah, I want to stay ahead of disaster this time. So they, people are not fucking around. They're moving. And then, oh, another weird phenomenon where I'm on tour with Bunuel in, in uh, October of last year. And I kept running into guys, American guys that I knew from the hardcore scene. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? He's like, hey, man, I can't afford to get old in America. I was like, he goes, yeah, all I have to do to get old here is speak the language. The healthcare thing is a big problem, you know, and I had surgery done on my ankle, you know, because I've been doing running hills with bags of gravel to get in shape for this fucking fighting shit that I do. And so I, my Achilles tendon was getting detached. So they had to go in and I didn't think anything of it because I've got insurance, but they also send you a breakdown of the cost. That surgery, pretty minor surgery on my ankle. I was off my feet for 10 days, cost $130,000, man. It, the surgery itself lasted an hour. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's like if I didn't have insurance, fuck you. And that's not that's that's not a way to get old in America. So I met four guys from the hardcore scene. Like two were in uh, Italy, and then two were in France. They were just like blue to clam bake, man. We're not staying. We gotta. Sorry, gotta go. And so I'm largely in the same position. I, I mean, my health is pretty good. Knock on knock on wood, but. Uh, I don't want to go broke in America. Ah. Or or alternatively, get shot. Yes, the, which is often a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot. And, you know, and the weird thing is, I mean, I, I used to have a federal firearms license for years, so I'm a big Second Amendment guy. I got, you know, um, but I just don't want everybody else to have them. <laughs> That's I, you know, so, somebody said to me, well, how often have you pulled your guns? Like in a situation where you might have needed it, and I was like, because, you know, Spain, they don't want you to have them. So I'm going through this thing. Oh, do I bring them? Do I sneak them in? How do I hide? The, you know, and I go one time. And uh, the guy goes, so you feared for your life and pulled your gun. I said, well, I didn't say I feared for my life. Go, so you pulled your gun. Yeah, I pulled a gun. <laughs> but you didn't fear for your life. No, no. Well, what did you do when you pulled your gun? I said, I made the guy give me his wallet. <laughs> He's like, hold on, hold on. Well, it's complicated. You rob it. No, 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 no. Uh, and, you know, it. Eugene, honestly, we're about to get kicked off Zoom, so let's just leave the story there. 